the day you're born, pretty much, you're on a side. If you're Louisville or you're Kentucky, you're red or you're blue. I'm a Cardinal fan and she's the other. I'm other? I'm a Cats fan. Why well, I gotta be a other? It's deeper than basketball. It's Lexington, Louisville. We can tell you everything about every game between the two schools for the last 25 years. This is bragging rights. This is UK over U of L. Red versus blue. I mean, it's blue versus red. And I don't care to tell you, I'm a blue guy. Duke, North Carolina, Butler, Xavier, your rivalry has nothing on this. This is what we live for. <laughs> Everybody knows me as Boone. I started cutting hair when I was about 16 years old. And I just opened my barbershop uh, six months ago in April. Red and black is, uh, that's, that's Louisville's colors. I mean, our college stands for it. I mean, everywhere you go, you see it. You know, and anybody who's from Louisville always represents it, even if they're somewhere else. You got Tom Cruise, heck of a Louisville fan. So what happens, with, uh, uh, what happens? Can I finish the name of the Louis? fans? Can I finish the name of the productive people in society who are Louisville fans who came from Louisville and are diehard Louisville fans? All my family is, is U of L, but actually I, I started logging in Kentucky um, maybe about 14, 15 years ago when my mom died. In the midst of all that, she showed them I liked them. I like them, she would say. If she can like them and take all that flack then I can stand in this city and wear this UK sweatshirt proudly. And that's why the red? And that's why we wear the red and we're proud of it. And we love our bird. That's our state bird. Come the on, Kentucky man. bird. Y'all bird been caged for the last 26, 27 years. Okay, but what color is Kentucky it, state bird? We're a wildcat running loose. How long have I been a barber? Ten years. Best move I ever made. Right now, we probably only have one Kentucky barber. And he's, he's, and yeah, and he's, he's not too loud with it. The barbershop of which I just left, you know, they are diehard Louisville fans. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm boisterous. That's, that's, that's what I think so different about Louisville and Kentucky fans versus the rest of the fans in, in college basketball. We're fanatics. We're crazy. We go crazy over this. Paintsville's in the eastern tip of Kentucky, about 30 miles from the West Virginia border. Very seldom you find a, a piece of red in the area, and, and, and when you do, somebody's going to get harassed pretty good. It's 99% UK. Of course, I don't live in Louisville, and I, I've read some things where people talk about. Uh, one guy, he lived on a block, and at, you know they put out their flags in the fall, and he would put out a Kentucky flag, and they'd be six Louisville flags, and he was one Kentucky flag. Well, at least he still had it. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, they didn't steal it, did they? That's, that's a very good point, yeah. If you drove by my house or do drive by, my Louisville flag is flying, and uh, I had it up all season, football and basketball. And Final Four, uh, Sunday morning, I get up, to go outside. Uh, I looked between two churches and uh, someone had liberated my Louisville flags. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just got a hunch it had to be a UK fan. Do what you do you think? think? Do, do you think that maybe somebody might have forgot to buy toilet paper last week? Oh. I actually had a guy come in and wanted me to frame the picture out of the newspaper of Christian Lecter making the shots. Oh, that's a tough one. And I told him no. <laughs> You don't need nope, money sorry. that bad. I don't. I don't need money that bad. That's right. Well, you know, that was our hometown boy that was trying to block that shot. Yeah, John yeah, Pelton. Yeah, I know. Bless his heart. High school basketball has always been big, especially up here in the mountains. You know, basketball is a way of life in the state of Kentucky. Uh, it's like horses and bourbon. We've had three play for the University of Kentucky. John Pelfrey, he was Mr. Basketball in the state of Kentucky. 
Todd Tackett, and then in 2008, Landon Sloan signed with the University of Kentucky. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's on my staff now. I played at uh, University of Kentucky uh, the 2008-2009 season under Coach Billy Gillespie. Every kid in Eastern Kentucky wants to put on that uniform, and uh, it was a great honor for me to for me to be able to do that. I told you I, I was going to make you a player, and I'm going to be tough on your ass, but you've you got to make that. There's no difference in, in, in coaching the player. Uh, it's always a joy to coach him, but it's the prestige thing with the kid that, that plays for you, signed with the University of Kentucky. <laughs> Up in the Cumberland Mountains of Old Kentucky, there's a little village. The only way to reach the village is to turn off the main highway several miles away and cut down, up, through and across hills, valleys, cliffs, and streams. Kentucky's always been a very poor state in many ways, uh, educationally, economically, and the state hasn't had a lot to be proud of. Basketball's vital to Kentucky because there are enough social, educational, economic drawbacks here that there has to be something to rally people around. You could go in any barber shop, you could go in any drugstore. Every time you sat down, you'd hear them talk about Kentucky basketball. Well, basketball is important to Kentucky because this is what we have. This is what we've been bred to do from Adolph Rupp times. Adolph Rupp came here in 1930, and he built the best basketball program in the country, and that gave everybody in the state uh, something that uh, to be proud of, something they could say that we're, we're the best, along with thoroughbred racing and the Kentucky Derby and bourbon whiskey, here's something we're the best at. Coach Rupp at uh, Kentucky, he made basketball a priority at the state school here, and consequently I think it, it just kind of caught on. Small rural communities had very little to do. Church and school was the main source of entertainment and involvement. Many of them were too small to support football teams because of the numbers required, but about any school could have a basketball team. It's a cheap sport. All it takes is a goal. Uh, sometimes the basket, you can hang it on the end of a barn. You can put some wire up there as a net, or you can put twine up there, and you're ready to play. The University of Kentucky was pressured by every state school to add them to the schedule. Coach Rupp and the university adopted an unwritten policy not to play any in-state school. At that time, Adolph Rupp, he didn't want to play anyone in his own state. He didn't want to give them the recognition. He felt like it would hurt their recruiting. and help other people's recruiting. He had developed the team as a nationally known team by playing a national competition with teams like St. John's and Holy Cross, St. Louis. So the policy was developed to maintain that national presence. I think in those years, the University of Kentucky regarded itself as the University of Kentucky. Uh, you have to remember, the University of Louisville was a metro city university. It was owned by the people of Louisville, but it was not in the state system. It was not funded with state dollars, and it did not get into the state system until the late 60s, actually 1968 legislature. Coach Rupp understood clearly his position of preeminence throughout the state, and frankly, uh, the other state universities, including Louisville, had, had never really proved that they uh, belonged to, uh, on the same level as Kentucky. Everyone had an opinion of Rupp, and he was sort of revered the state, but outside the border, there were a lot of people who took shots at him. Uh, some people even went so far as to call him a racist, which he wasn't. Think about uh, the fact that Wes Unsold almost came here, and Butch Beard almost came here. They ended up going to L. Why? Because there was a feeling that uh, Coach Rupp uh, was racist. Yet in the early 50s, St. John's and Solly Walker, who was an African American, played in the UKIT, and played intersectional game against Kentucky, and Coach Rupp went to the Phoenix Hotel and said that they would never get another business from the University of Kentucky if they didn't accept African American. People know the story about Texas Western and uh, them being the first program to win a national championship with five black starters. 
most people don't know that the second program to go to a Final Four with five black stars was Louisville in 1975. Louisville had been the first program south of the Mason-Dixon line to integrate. I think if you just look at the, the demographics of the fan bases, uh, Louisville much more of an African-American percentage of fans, I think, than Kentucky, and that just goes to the demographics of the state. Kentucky's total population is 10% of African-American, and of that 10%, 80% live in the Louisville area. I think that really... Uh, heightened the, the differences and the tensions for a long time. I, like I said, I think it's gotten a lot better all the way around. It was kind of like the blacks cheered for U of L and the whites cheered for UK. Sounds kind of weird, funny, that's how it kind of was. UK fans called Louisville the Blackbirds for a long time. And if you go to message boards enough, UK message boards, you'll still see it come up every now and then. There was a racial element of it 40 years ago, I think. You know, and we, a lot of Kentucky fans, we wish that wasn't the case, but it's just true. I think it, one of the reasons why Louisville fans get mad at me, I, I guess, is how can you be a Kentucky fan? You understand the racism that comes from Kentucky? But they want to know in certain parts of the city where am I repping a UK jersey and I'm a black guy. Are there still black people today that are like, I'm not rooting for Kentucky because of back then? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would submit that maybe some of them you'll get to see tomorrow. Tomorrow, Boone, Boone's coming back. Okay. A bunch of UK fans. <laughs> okay. What is it going to be like? It's going to be hell literate. How long has it been since you're down there at the barbershop? Uh, I've been down there once or twice, but I left back in uh, March. We want to see Louisville do good, but when they compete and compare against Kentucky, it is our duty to put them in their rightful place. We have the most championships, the most Final Four. We represent this state, and they just need to fall in line with that. The champs are here. Y'all hate to see us coming. What it do, man? What's up, man? You, man? you got UK on one side. You got UVA on the other side. What's up with that? Hey, I'm a team player. I'm a team player. They both, they both represent me. Card country, baby. Card country. UK ain't nothing this year. They ain't got John Wall, nobody Davis, nobody down low. They sloppy. How many championships have you won? Part time. Now you're going to walk away Come from on, that man. answer. How many championships have you won? A deucey. You won two. A deucey. When's the last time you won your last one? What difference does that make? Oh, it makes a big difference. Come on, man. Now, 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 now we, we, we like the, the seventh one. win. Time out for a minute. Time out for a minute. Come on, don't do that. Don't do that. Tag. Get it. Get it. When's the last time y'all won? Come on, man. Don't do that. We was probably one. We was probably We got so many championships. We got so many championships. I can tag team and hand them out for. Isn't that the basis? Isn't that the basis of why you're not a Kentucky fan? Because because Louisville fans say that Kentucky was so racist that you would never be Kentucky. Is it a lie? And now lie? and now you're telling me that lie? Calipari has put ten African Americans in the pros. Isn't that a turnaround? Kentucky didn't do America, Kentucky we need your fanship. That's a problem. You have a problem. He's a Republican. He's a Republican. Man, this ain't about basketball. This is about uh, the voting. You know he's. You know he don't like Obama. <laughs> Sweat, man. Yeah, man, got me hyped up, man. I had to come over and get some air. by Louisville, good game by UK. The rest were horrible. They cheated. Baby, why we cheat? No, that's a conspiracy. That's, that's b Seriously. that you would even say it. Seriously. Excuse my French, but you know we just whooped y'all literally. It's a conspiracy. With no questions asked. It's a conspiracy. And that's all I got to Every say Every time we come up here, it's always something. Ah, so now we cheat. They never respect the okay, red. Okay, we'll bring it home. They can bring it to Louisville, we still gonna whoop they Never respect the red. What? Louisville all day. Blue all day. Like we'll some do some. Well, we'll, we'll see them next year at the uh, Yum Center. Look at the young citizen. Yeah, it's all good. It, 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 it's all good. I had a fantastic time. Yeah, they did. First time great. at Rupp Arena. I heard they used to call this Corrupt Arena, but, but yeah. I, I, I got a different feel today.
The weird thing about this game coming up is that Kentucky has won a national title. So you're coming off four wins in a row over Louisville. So the weirdest thing that's really happened is that Kentucky fan is sort of they're okay with maybe being the underdog in this game. And if you lose it, you lose it. They sort of checked out a tad bit. In the Final Four last year, if it was must win for Kentucky, this is must win for Louisville. It's as big as the regular season game between the two has been maybe ever. It's a big game today. Biggest rivalry in the country, so we're excited. I mean, obviously you see it's 20 degrees outside and we're going to be rocking downtown today. I and mean, it's the biggest day of the year for people to live in the state and obviously the city of Louisville. Yeah, Louisville, Kentucky! Let's kill it! Let's CBS Sports coverage of the road to the Final Four brings you to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Louisville is at home in the Young Center. Are they good enough to compete? But for Louisville, expectations and experience, are they good enough to win it all? Only 80 miles separates these two. And boy, when you uh, come in here, you better be wearing blue or red. I think they may eject you from the pool. Somebody is going to be honest. So I think the 0 4 thing really made a lot of people uncomfortable. The Louisville fan base definitely needed uh, to see Rick beat Kentucky. If you're going to have a rivalry, that means that both sides have to win. Coaches understandably down, downplay those storylines. These guys are, as I said, very intense competitors and, and uh, uh, rightfully proud about what they've accomplished. So if you uh, go through a, a losing streak to, uh, to a rival, uh, that has to, uh, I would think, eat at the competitor in you. It's a real important game for the fans. For us, we want to beat Kentucky, but not as much as the fans do. I think the culture of Kentucky is mountain-oriented. There's something about the mountains that's a part of all of us when we relate to being a Kentucky. Louisville has always been like a separate island. I was never west of Lexington in my life. We didn't go to Louisville growing up. For many years, the state high school basketball tournament was rotated between Lexington and Louisville. It always irritated me when you talked to anybody from Jefferson County that they didn't know where any other town in the state was besides Louisville. So I always considered Jefferson County part of Indiana because it, I just didn't think it was part of Kentucky at all. Louisville is its own state and Kentucky is its own state. You know, then Ohio and Indiana and all of that. I'm from the state of Louisville. There is a huge cultural gap between Kentucky fans and Louisville fans. Here it's not uncommon for a you know for a child to be raised knowing how to you know shoot a gun, fish, things of that nature. And you know there are people in more urban areas that the thoughts of uh, letting a child uh, eight or nine years old target shoot that that's uh, you know that's reprehensible. Kentucky is a farming kind of country kind of state. Louisville is a big city. So you actually have two different types of personality, people-wise. People out in the rest of the state view Louisville the same way that I think a lot of people around the country view New York. There's gang violence everywhere. You know, you can't walk anywhere without being shot. That's how people out in the state look at Louisville, and they don't like it. Out in the state, for some reason, has a problem with Louisville and Jefferson County, and Jefferson County and Louisville has a problem with out in the state. So it's not just UK and U of L; it's the dynamics of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. That game comes down to cultural warfare in the form of a 40-minute basketball game. It's all these differences that Louisville has with the rest of the state coming to a head on a basketball court. 
radio was the linchpin to the following that Kentucky built in the state. Back in the uh, early 50s and all through the 60s, there were uh, three or four networks who originated live broadcast, play-by-play -play broadcast of Kentucky games. Two great announcers, Claude Sullivan, who was based in Lexington, Kaywood Ledford, who was based in Louisville. Claude died of cancer in 1967 at a very young age. And that's when uh, the UK radio network was formed with Kaywood Ledford as being the sole voice of the Wildcats. Of course, his voice was on WHAS. And WHAS was, was the station that you could hear way, way out. Kaywood was the, the guy who uh, brought the cats into the homes of, of a, a very passionate and uh, loyal fan base. The people up in the mountains, they'd go to a, a little restaurant in the morning after the game, and they'd all say, did you hear what Kaywood said last night? Oh, boy. When he came on the air, kind of sent a chill down your, your back, you know. It, it would, he had that kind of presence. And Kaywood just became so widely beloved around the state, he could have run for governor and won in a landslide. Kaywood was born to be the Kentucky announcer. He was born to be that. He, he, everybody loved Kaywood to death. His last game uh, that he called was that Duke-Kentucky game in 1992. And even though Kentucky didn't win that game, what a great game to go out on. Coach Rupp was uh, the, uh, the czar of basketball. He won the national championship in 48, 49, 51. And during those years, that kind of success was just unheard of. They were so far ahead of everybody else in the SEC. You know, he was averaging winning all those games by 30 points. That back when Ralph Beard and uh, Kenny Rollins, and Alex Rosen, and Ralph and Cliff Barker, and Wawa Jones, Joe Holland, those are great players. And after the war, he was so loaded, he had all Americans sitting on the bench. Really, they didn't even start. They had that many good players. You could have as many as you wanted in those days. There was no limit. Rupp used to have tryouts for like 80 players, and he'd pick out the best ones he wanted. It was legal. Taking over for Coach Rupp, naturally, there was tremendous pressure. But uh, I had the secure feeling that I had spent seven years in the program. There, were, uh, there was nothing that was going to happen that would have surprised me. I can't imagine what it was like for Joe <laughs> because of uh, having to follow a legend and know what it's like in the, in the broadcasting business when you're following a legend. I didn't have to do that. I was one removed from Kaywood, so that's, that's a good place to be. It's hard following Adolph Rupp. I mean, you know, Adolph was Adolph, and Adolph got credit, wanted credit, deserved credit, and Joby was his assistant, so it was a tough job, but he had the respect of the assistants here. And no matter what, Coach Hall just kept going forward. And every interview that I ever had with him, uh, any interview anybody ever had with him, he talked continually about the legacy of the program. and and that his job was to carry it on, his job was to continue to build it, and he did. Winning it in 78 was big, especially when you've got the target on your back. And then the Cats had the target on their back right from the, the beginning of that year with, with Kyle Macy coming in, and, uh, and then to have to, to have to beat Arkansas in a tough game in the semifinal and beat Duke to win it, it was, it was, it was really something. I can't imagine many programs where the equipment manager becomes uh, an iconic figure or gains uh, the status that, that Mr. Wildcat did. He was the last link to Adolph Rupp and Kentucky as the undisputed heavyweight champion of, of college basketball. Bill Kitely was my mailman uh, when I started my company. He was a full-time employee of the post office department. And then later on, I think he was actually a full-time equipment manager. Bill was the most genuine man I've ever met. The first time I met Bill, probably talked to him for 45 minutes. I felt like I knew him all my life. He, makes, he made you feel like that. Oh, everybody loves Bill Kiley. He's a sweetheart. He's a fellow you want to have breakfast with every morning. He was the ultimate fan. Man. He, could be, he could afford to be more of a fan than Kaywood. Kaywood might be one, but he couldn't say it. He is uh, the eternal optimist who truly did hate Louisville. The biggest thing for Bill was to beat Louisville. That's, that, was his, that was his thing. He always said that Christmas never really came until you beat Louisville.
early in the development of Louisville's program. They were in the smaller college division, the NAI. And in 44, they hired Peck Hickman, and he got some Navy transfers during World War II. One of them was an All-American at Harvard, of all places, George Hopfuhr. And he began to beat Indiana and Purdue and other good teams. I think the game that really started Louisville before Denny got here was the mid-50s when they won the, the NIT in New York, Madison Square Garden. The NIT was the top tournament at that time. I think that really put Louisville on the map. I'd first become aware of uh, Denny Crum when I was covering college basketball for Sports Illustrated in the late 60s and early 70s. He was young, charismatic, came from UCLA, was coached by Coach Wooden. And when he got here, he dominated. But when Denny came to town, you went to the Final Four right away in 1972. And that sort of ups the ante right at the outset. Then he had, he had a mind, he had that John Wooden brain, and he brought the, the high post offense, which at that time, no three-point shot. That's what made a lot of Denny's team so successful. An organized offense, but yet the players had the freedom to, uh, to show their individual talents at the same time. Uh, Louisville had developed a, a cast of characters uh, uh, that came to be known as the Doctors of Dunks. And they were looking for something so that they could identify themselves and separate them from everyone else. So they had they developed uh, these Doctor Smocks and things for warm ups and and stuff. I don't know. It was kind of crazy. There was a very soulful presence to that team, and. It was very much in stark contrast to what Joby Hall had going on at Kentucky. Not as much from a racial standpoint, but just from a very buttoned down, very serious uh, way of playing basketball and comporting themselves, whereas up the road, Louisville was fun and freewheeling. They won the style war by a lot. The style of play that Louisville had, I think, was appealing to recruits. And that just put that much more pressure on the Kentucky program. And to this day, I think that's uh, the 1980 U of L team that won the the NCAA at Indianapolis was one of the truly really great teams. 14 seconds left. Denny Crum, who has been eliminated from the Final Four and has two other opportunities by UCLA, and now is only 14 seconds away from that precious first national championship. We had got, you know, Daryl Griffith, who was as good a player all around as most anybody you'll ever find. They called Griffith Dr. Duncanstein. Dr. Duncanstein. I've never seen anybody ever be able to dunk the basketball like Daryl Griffith. I just didn't think it got any better than Daryl Griffith, you know what I'm saying? Won the championship, you know, player of the year. When I was a kid and my friends and I would play basketball in the backyard, I was always Daryl Griffith. People like be like, are oh, you trying to be like George? Or they look like George? You know, when I was coming up, people was like, you trying to be like Griff? And that's who that's who we emulated when we were kids. You know, it was Daryl Griffith and, uh, you know, Jerry Eves and all those guys, man. They didn't care who scored or who got the credit. And I think if you don't care who gets the credit, why a lot of good things can happen to your teams. Denny, what's all the excitement? Just another day at the office. Uh, not exactly <laughs> another day. It's a, it's a day of history. Congratulations, Denny. Thanks a lot, man. It's what I wanted since I came here. It's not a bad way to finish your career. Not at all. Not at all. Bryant, I thought Denny Crum's comment was most significant. He says, you can't live in the past. It was our turn this year. In 1948, they had a qualifying tournament for the Olympic team, and Louisville qualified by winning the NAIB. Kentucky won the NCAA and qualified. So Kentucky played Louisville in the first game and beat us like 91 to 57. And of course, they represented the USA in London and won the Olympic medal. And when they came back, there was a train station downtown Lexington. I'll never forget that. And they, they took them up down in convertible down down Main Street. Well, in '59, they didn't even televise the game. That was probably the worst record that we had in the years that I was at the University of Louisville. I think uh, going into tournament time, we were probably uh, mm, probably 13 wins and probably 10 losses. It was in Evanston, Illinois, at Northwestern University. So it was on the radio, Louisville's down by 15 in the first half, and Louisville ended up winning, I think it was 76-61. And it was just unreal, because Kentucky was number two in the country, and Louisville was, you know, not ranked. 
Well, when I took the Louisville job, I felt like it was important that, that we play the best schedule we could play. And you want to play the best teams? Well, Kentucky was usually one of the best teams. Denny immediately uh, uh, just couldn't understand why Kentucky and Louisville didn't play. And there was a story in the newspaper about what great recruits Kentucky had. And then he said, well, yeah, they have a great class, but I think have one better. And that really was the first time that anybody had ever questioned uh, Kentucky's superiority in the state. I, I kind of kept on Kentucky. I chided them in the news about not being willing to play us. Denny was kind of the great villain because he was pushing for this game. And Kentucky doesn't like to be pushed. When Ed Diddle was having some great teams at Western Kentucky, when Peck Hickman was here at the University of Louisville, they kind of accepted things uh, the, the way they were, and they never made any particular big racket about wanting to play Kentucky. It was just a foregone conclusion that Kentucky was on a different level from everybody else. Coach Hall was entrenched in his position that he had inherited really from, from Coach Rupp, and I think believed in, and so uh, you had two uh, strong forces on either end of the spectrum that both had you know, top five programs and uh, the uh, pressure from uh, media and, and uh, to uh, fans certainly uh, just continued to grow. Denny Crum goes to the NCAA in 72, then he goes in 75, then in 1980 we won the championship. By that time everybody's saying, well how come these two teams are never playing? The idea was really catching hold that Louisville is now at that position where it deserves to be in the same conversation with Kentucky. So I thought, now's the time to write a column that says, okay, it's time uh, for Kentucky to get off its high horse, and it's time to begin a series in both uh, basketball and football. I have to give Billy Reed quite a bit of credit. He was a, a, a top writer in the state. Billy Reed had Kentucky ties, but he worked here in Louisville. I don't think the Lexington media was pushing into that much but it began to roll like a, like a snowball downhill. The Courier-Journal had home delivery in all 120 Kentucky counties. When people around the state got up on Tuesday morning, they knew that Louisville had won the championship, and the first thing that a lot of the Kentucky fans read was my column, and they just went ballistic. There was a, a really a strong anti-response uh, around the state, which was predominantly uh, dominated by Kentucky. Here in Jefferson County, of course, uh, the Louisville fans loved it. We just wanted that uh, game so bad. If we lost, we lost. If we won, we won. But we thought we could win our senior year. We were ranked number one in the country, and, you know, we just wanted to line up against them. A lot of people don't remember that in 1975, if uh, Terry Howard, who was a 90-plus percent free throw shooter, hadn't missed the front end of a one-and-one, U of L would have been playing Kentucky in the final championship game and not UCLA. Yeah, the almost game, the biggest almost game of all, 1975. They had to go to San Diego and play Coach John Wooden. The big feeling was that if Louisville beat UCLA, it could be an all Kentucky final. Everything was going good. We were up almost the whole game, and, and uh, it was just a super game. Long loop to Brisbane, drives to the baseline. Bounces along the baseline, turned and put up an end by Button. Bill Button racked up his seventh point, and Louisville leads by four, 43 to 39. And so uh, uh, we're one point up, and it's our ball. And so here, you know, here it is again. Uh, it's in my hands, like like always, because that's just what we do. And that's just what we did. Terry Howard with it. He, they, uh, they would rather he be fouled than anybody out there. Coach Wooden was standing up on the sidelines, which he never stood up. He was screaming, which he never screamed. And he was saying, don't foul Howard, don't foul Howard. He had missed a free throw, don't foul Howard. And uh, they fouled Howard, myself. 20 seconds to go, one and one, he fires it. It hit the right side of the rim, left side, it went in, and then it, and, and then it bounced out. But now they got the rebound, and they had to hustle down and make the shot. Nine seconds left, off of the right side. It goes to Johnson. They go into Washington. Up for a jumper, 10. He's got it. UCLA went to 75 to 74. We got to the final four, uh, which was, I think, a, a really good accomplishment, and it kind of catapulted us, you know, into, a, into the national scene. 1982, I've never seen Louisville more excited. Everybody just assumed that Louisville and 
Kentucky were going to meet in that tournament. Louisville and Kentucky were both sent to a regional down in Nashville, Tennessee, and it looked like a meeting was inevitable. Kentucky was to play Middle Tennessee, and everybody thought, well, all Kentucky's got to do is show up, and they'll beat Middle Tennessee, and they'll be playing Louisville on Saturday. Middle cannot beat Kentucky. Can't do it, no way, unless Kentucky shoots uh, almost zero percent. The telephones are ringing off the hook. People got questions about everything. I get a call, a man says, Van, now, I don't know whether this man was a crazy Kentucky fan or a crazy Louisville fan, but he was a crazy fan. He said, Van, I need to ask you a question. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, I'm going to be in Samoa Saturday when Louisville and Kentucky play that game. Can you tell me what channel that game is going to be on in Samoa? <laughs> I said, man, I don't even know if they have a television station in Samoa. But there was one big problem. The dream game never came off because a little heard of university called Middle Tennessee beat Kentucky and took the Wildcats' place against U of L. Everybody was just shocked by that. Uh, Joe Hall, I think his, his uh, comment after the game was that Kentucky had lost its electrolytes. But people were really disappointed. I think a lot of people were because they thought that was going to be the year, but they had to wait one more year before they finally got what came to be known as the dream game. The dream game was actually set up by CBS and the NCAA. That's what caused that game to be played. Finally, you had this meeting uh, for the first time in 25 years, both in Knoxville and all over the state of Kentucky. The anticipation was overwhelming. Kentucky by five, by easy. Five. By easy. No, Louisville by five. Okay. Friend, I'll, I, 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 I'll meet you right here Monday morning. If Kentucky loses to Louisville, are you going to hate Louisville more? No. I think they're my second favorite team. Still will be. Well, they've got me a hat made up here where on one side it's the Kentucky Wildcats, on the other side it's the U of L Cardinals. So I guess I'll have to wear uh, it one way one half and the other way the other half. Louisville and Kentucky are finally going to play each other. But why the two schools do not play each other on a regularly scheduled basis is a touchy subject, as John Tesh found out. These two schools are so close, and they both have great basketball programs, yet... Uh, can, can we dissolve here just a minute? They're afraid of you? Well, what did you, did you ask them then? Well, we asked Coach Hall... And, and he wouldn't give you an answer, would he? Well, he, he uh, tried to walk out in the interview, actually. Yeah, well, that's typical. Joe did not paint himself in the best light at that time. And it made Kentucky look weak. And it made them look scared. And uh, then he really had the upper hand going into that game. It was quite a scene, the excitement and uh, the expectation of what was going to happen. You almost kind of catch your breath just to see them warming up on the same court. You felt like you were witnessing history. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the University of Tennessee for the championship game of the 1983 NCAA Mideast Regional Basketball Tournament. If you remember the, the way that the press box was at Stokely Athletic Center, uh, uh, it, uh, it, they walked up on a catwalk and the thing just shook. You were lucky if you walked out of there without a visual impairment of some kind <laughs> because the blue and the red are down there playing in solid orange everywhere. It was everything that you could possibly expect in a rivalry in sports. We want Big Blue! We want Big Blue! Go Big Blue! The night before, uh, I thought, well, I wonder what it would look like if, if I took a red coat and cut it in half and then a blue coat and matched them up. John Y. Brown, who was a Kentucky graduate, was the governor of the state of Kentucky, and he wore a sport coat that had blue on this side and down the sleeve and red on one other side down the sleeve, and uh, he sat right at center court. Well, I think the crowd was sort of stunned, you know, when the Kentucky fans didn't like it, figuring he was a... UK alumnus that he should be for them, and of course the Louisville fans loved it. He is wearing, as you can see, the split coat, the red and the blue. He sat on the Kentucky side the first half, now on the Louisville side in the second half. Louisville had a habit, that team and a lot of Denny's teams, of struggling in early parts of games to get it all together. They would always fall behind, but by the end of the game, here they'd come. And that's kind of the way that game shaped up. You know, it was a game that Kentucky seemed to have 
locked up and then let it get away. The tension was so thick you could cut it with a dull knife. 20 seconds. It was nip and tuck the whole way. We jumped ahead by two, and then Masters from their team hit a shot. There goes Dirk. Two, they're going to have to get it out. Masters, it'll count. Both teams played great basketball, but in the overtime, Louisville was able to get on a roll, and in the overtime, they played uh, just about the finest five minutes or so of basketball you'll ever see a team play. Neither one of these teams have lost in overtime this year. You know, you talk about this being for the championship of the Mideast. I think the key is, is it the championship of Kentucky, which will be something they'll talk about much longer. Overtime started, and I think uh, Louisville scored first, um, and then Kentucky scored, and then the world exploded. Milt and... Lancaster just steel dunk, steel dunk, steel dunk, and every steal and every dunk, it got louder and it got louder and it got louder. It was pretty hard because there was so much on the line. And you're not just talking about playing Louisville here. You're talking about for the right to go to the Final Four. You got to give UL credit. They come back and play the heck of a game. Well, who are you pulling for now? Houston. <laughs> I'm very excited. We've been waiting for this day to let UK know that UBell's got it all. We whooped those pussycats. Meow, meow. I love it. I love it. How happy are you? Pretty happy. I was for Kentucky, but I'll take this. Are you going to root for the cards now? You better believe it. Of course, if you're a Louisville fan, we beat them 12 points in overtime, so... For you, that had to be a dream come true. Uh, probably not a dream game for Kentucky fans, but if you wanted to see both teams play, and it was probably a dream game for everyone. <laughs> To have all that build up for everybody's lifetime, and then they go into that game, and to have it actually be as good as what everybody wanted it to be. That's phenomenal. It really did start the rivalry. That, that started it. And then all of our cheerleaders out there got together, their cheerleaders and our cheerleaders, and they intertwined arm and they sang my old Kentucky home. It was sort of like the Israelis and the Palestinians coming together. It was certainly a, a very, very emotional day uh, for a lot of people in Kentucky who were invested heavily in basketball. After the game in Knoxville, uh, Kentucky didn't right away say that we were going to play Louisville. There were pros and cons about whether you should or should not play them. A lot of people felt like I did, and what are you going to accomplish by it? And a lot of people felt like, why not? We're, they're 80 miles up the road, and they're they're in the top ten all the time, why don't you play each other? As usual, money stepped in. One of my goals when I took office was to have U of K play U of L. A week before I left office, I remember, oh my gosh, you know, I haven't done anything on that. And the chairman of the board of UK happened to be in my cabinet, Bill Sturgill. And so I called him the night before their board meeting, and I said, now, Bill, you promised me to get this game on. It needs to get on. And... Uh, he said, well, Doc Singletary doesn't want it. And I said, now, Bill, I got the votes on that board. If you need me to come over there <laughs> and vote. And he said, okay, Governor, I'll get it done. And he got it done. And I think it's a great rivalry. And finally, in the summer of 1983, they agreed to play a home-and-home a -home series. Coach Crum had pushed hard for it. He wanted it, and he had it. And as it turned out, it wasn't going to be easy for him. Uh, it wasn't going to be easy at all. first 10 years of the series, it pretty much went Kentucky's way. You can strike up a U of L UK conversation or argument, depending on which way you want to go, any day of the week of any month, any time. That game means so much. 
that game, sometimes people, you know, UK fans or U of L fans, all they really worry about is winning that one game, and the rest of the season, you know, whatever, whatever happens, happens. But that one game is so important. Ask a fan, what do you want more, to beat UK or to win a national championship? You got some fans that say beat UK and go two and thirty in the, in the entire season. So it's it's really like that out here. That game in December or that game in early January. You lose it, you're hearing about it for an entire year. It doesn't matter what your team does the rest of the year. We won the national championship in 98, but, Kentucky, uh, but Louisville beat us by three at our place. And, uh, you know, I, I would come home and I would hear the, you know, number one in the nation, number two in the state from people. You know, that was a little annoying. Whether Kentucky wins or lose, I get a family member. They'll call me, you know, and what about Louisville? What about Louisville? This and that. And then, oh, my God, the pandemonium in my family for Louisville. And of course, what's phenomenal about it is, is, you know, if we're not both top 10 teams, it's unusual. They're always very good. We're always very good. Yeah, there'll be ups and downs every now and then, not very often, but it really doesn't matter when they play. Even if the Wildcats should win by 15, they're not. Even if we're supposed to win by 15, they're not. It's, it's always a good game. Uh, everybody looks forward to it around here, and it really means something special around here. If grown men didn't fear what others would say about sh shedding tears and stuff like that. Some of these guys would cry after I lost. You know what I'm saying? I feel that way sometimes. And that was it. The last time I ever rooted for the Dirty Birds. Uh, that's the way it is. You have to understand the fan mentality. And what the fan mentality is, it's the number one rule it's not you love your team. It's you hate your rival. The constant, I guess, uh, uh, my team's better than your team. I mean, it is omnipresent, and it's, my school has more class than your school, and my school does things the right way, and yours doesn't. And, you know, we're funnier, and we're smarter, and our degrees are better, and everything. I mean, it, it, it just permeates kind of every level. Of all the places I've been, and all the rivalries that I've seen, uh, and I coached 41 years, uh, I can tell you there's none more intense than the Louisville-Kentucky Kentucky rivalry. North Carolina Duke, the rivalry is based, I think, on the status of the programs and the, competitive of the competitiveness of the games. There's not as much passion. There. If Duke loses to North Carolina in that first game in January, you know, they go home, they study, they do whatever they do if you're a Duke fan. And they, you know, they say, well, we'll get them next time. And if we don't get them next time, we might get them in the ACC tournament. Kentucky Louisville fans, you get one chance. I think both fans are as passionate about their programs as any place in the United States. These are fans who would bleed for their, for their teams and do bleed for their teams. There's nothing that infuses passion than Kentucky versus Louisville, blue versus red, red versus blue. There's nothing, any place in this country, that evokes that kind of uh, passion and feeling. I didn't think it would be that crazy, like, as far as basketball, because, you know, New York, Mecca, but this is up there, like, as far as the U.K. and Louisville, and then uh, you got Indiana across the bridge, then you even got Western Kentucky fans, diehard fans of those guys, and Bellamy, it's, it's nice. It means nothing to me. I don't care about the rivalries. Sometimes I get upset with the players because I don't see the players playing as hard as I want them to play when they play Kentucky, but they don't understand the rivalry that the fans have. Have you ever heard the history of it? Has anyone ever taught you it? No, I don't, even, I don't really want to know. Because I see people like going crazy. They just come in to play another game of ball that they Basketball is just huge here. You know, we don't have a pro team here. And so uh, everybody just loves Louisville and Kentucky basketball. So, um, you know, this is great. I mean, it's fun for the fans. You know, this is what you come to college for. And uh, it's a great experience out here. What kind of fans are you going to be? Uh, Louisville. Throw up your L. Throw up your L, Avery. Throw them up. Come on. No, you got to use two fingers. Yeah, like that. Put them together. Bing. Put them together. Bing. Yeah. Say Louisville. Say Louisville. Yeah, y'all heard him. I've always lived in Eastern Kentucky, and I've always been from the country. Eastern Kentucky's always been a poor, impoverished area. Kentucky basketball is something I think you can be proud of, even though things may be tough at home, and you know the 
crops may be not doing very good or work may be going bad or whatever, and you think everything's against you, well, we can watch Kentucky basketball and see winners and everything's okay. I started this business in uh, the summer of 1985. I guess that makes 27 years I've been doing this. Been coming to work five or six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, ever since, ever since then. And I really like the fact that I get to uh, frame a lot of Kentucky stuff. Because <laughs> I enjoy that. Put that on there along with that. I think that'll look really nice. That looks really good. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. See and I uh, should have this probably about a week or so ago. Okay. Christmas time is my busiest season. But I make sure if I have to, I go home, watch the game, and come back to work. But I will, I will watch the game if at all possible. Like I say, nothing in particular made me a Kentucky fan. I think I just was ever since I can open up remember because my dad was a Kentucky fan. Elliot Brindley, 46 years old. Been a Louisville fan since 1975. I was actually a Hoosier by birth. Cardinal by the grace of God, so they say. Cardinal country. Who's on there? Felton Spencer, Purvis Ellison, Kenny Payne, Will Ologis. Yeah, man, this stuff's ancient. I don't think I ever wore this shirt because it's a large and it would probably swallow me now, so I know it would have swallowed me at 15. The original Dream Game ticket stub, yeah, it's in pretty good shape, I'd say. Really, the biggest memory I have is the first Dream Game when I was about 14 years old. I believe I was in late middle school or early high school. Uh, uh, Miss Jones, do you have Elliot Brindley in your class? And I thought, oh my God, what did I do now? Uh, can you send him to the office, please? And I thought, man, this is not going to end well. So I go up to the office and my dad's standing there. Bad news. He's got his trench coat on. I'm like, oh my God, they called him up here. I'm in huge trouble. And he pulls the tickets out. Went back to class, got my books, got in a car with uh, my, my mother, my father, another couple, and we drove all the way to Knoxville, and that was just, that game was unbelievable, unbelievable game. I'll never forget it, ever. That's the, one of the defining moments of my sports history. My perception is that, that, that Louisville fans are just nasty people. They're the people that, uh, that don't have anything constructive to say about anything. They're just looking to tear something down. First and foremost, I'm a Louisville fan. Second off, I'm a Kentucky hater. I don't care what game they play, I want them to lose. Uh, Kentucky fans ignore Louisville and that upsets the Louisville fans. They, they, just, uh, they just don't consider Louisville to be worthy to be in their thought process. There, there are people, they have UK hubcaps. They have a, their commode seat is UK. Towels they dry off with is UK. They wear blue and white clothes everywhere. They dress up like old cheerleaders. Both teams, both sides. You look in my closet, you're going to see Louisville, 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 Kentucky hater, Kentucky hater, Louisville, 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 Kentucky hater, Louisville, Louisville. All right, that's all I dressed. Also, in relations to Louisville, it's very important for Kentucky fans to say, we are better than you. Kentucky fans don't know anything about Kentucky basketball. Yeah, they might know their players, and they're real passionate about their team, but a lot of times you get to asking them some questions about other even SEC teams or, you know, what's going on with the rest of the country and stuff, they, and they, they really you know not that knowledgeable to me. From my experiences, UofL fans are not completely diehard, sold-to-the-bone fans. Being a Kentucky fan is a central part of who they are. For a lot of them, not all of them, but for a lot of them. It's more a major part of what they do. It's very comparable to religion. I think people have that one friend or those two friends who are so rational in every other aspect of life, but when religion comes into play, they just they can't think or speak or act or hear or think rationally. And that's the way UK fans are. Our fervor is described as almost religious, and um, the arena itself, Rupp Arena, is often described as a secular cathedral or temple or shrine. But I think what that says is that there's a spirit associated with it that is uplifting. And that's what's so important. When Eddie left, it was probably the lowest ebb of Kentucky basketball in history. An Emory air freight envelope broke open on a conveyor belt in Los Angeles full of cash. Uh, address from the UK basketball office to the father of UK player Chris Mills. I remember when I heard about it, I think this was on a Saturday night, I could immediately see 
the future unfolding and it wasn't a very pleasant future to contemplate. Uh, I was working for Sports Illustrated, as I said earlier, and we did a cover story called Kentucky Shame. It was kind of like a family legacy falling apart. When Rick Pitino came in as the Kentucky coach, I was convinced it would just take years uh, to get Kentucky back to the top. When he came to UK, the program was uh, its as close to the death penalty as anybody's had without getting it. Rick always loves to be an underdog and work himself up. And there was no better place to come than Kentucky because it had a history. What he did in his first season, they went 14 and 14. Kaywood Ledford said it was a miracle. Said he should be coach of the year for what he did. To this day, I don't think there's another coach any place that was available then uh, that could have done what Rick Patino did with this program. To be honest with you, I wasn't a Rick fan. Uh, I wasn't a Rick fan because he's an Ivy League man, you know, nice tie, nice dress. I didn't think he'd make it to Kentucky. Well, he was a Yankee, first of all. We didn't hardly understand him. <laughs> but once he started winning, we learned to appreciate him. He had committed to a philosophy, and that is that they were going to shoot threes like crazy, and they were going to press like crazy, and they were going to live and die with that. Don't wait and let them come to your body. Rotate up to the man and rotate down on the inside. All right, this Kentucky fans adored him. They loved his sort of New York attitude and, you know, his, his swagger. And uh, uh, and then those early Kentucky teams he had are the most beloved in the history of the school. The Unforgettables, of course, was the, the team that lost to Duke with the Leitner shot. They're called the Unforgettables because when Coach Patino came in as the head coach, these four guys, they were not the probably the most athletic group but they had the hearts and they're the ones that stuck it out and uh, uh, they'll always be remembered. And the team that he put together in 1996 is probably the best team that I've ever seen. They were so deep. Their second five was like a top 15 team as well. He actually could have won another title there, but he had one kid there, Anderson, I think his name was. What he didn't play because of the knee. In 1996, we won a championship. 97, my senior year, I got hurt. We went to the championship game and lost in overtime. We won it again in 1998. We had a dynasty in a, in a modern era that was unheard of. God, if I would have played, maybe we would have won that. But, but I think we had a dynasty of a team that people could just look at and be like, this team is just unbelievable. That's why we were ranked number one or two in any polls of the best college team put together. So I was just proud to be a part of that moment in college basketball. You know, Louisville went through a little soft spot there six, seven years, and all that comes back to the recruiters they had. Denny's recruiting fell off some after he lost Wade Houston as a coach. You know, Wade went to Tennessee. We would have probably won another couple of national championships with Allen Houston. There was no doubt about it. This is a program that was the preeminent team in the 1980s, and then all of a sudden you go to the 1990s where you have guys who can't make a jump shot. You're losing 21 games in the regular season. Wolf fans were tired of losing, and they wanted a guy who could win, and, and where better are you going to go than Rick Pitino? He was weighing between, uh, I think, Michigan and uh, Louisville at that time. And the rumor was that he was going to take the Michigan job which I preferred. <laughs> I remember the day, it was in March of 2001, and I was in Philadelphia with Kentucky, which was getting ready to play in the Sweet 16. I said, Rick's going to Louisville, they're going to announce it today. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. They literally would not believe it until they saw it. Dean Smith wouldn't coach Duke. Mike Krzyzewski wouldn't coach Carolina. Clearly, Rick Pitino would not coach Louisville, and then he did. And so all that love that was there for him turned into hate. I think a lot of people uh, felt like that he was Benedict Arnold. What gets forgotten, which is, is that, the, that he went to the Celtics in between. <laughs> he did not leave to take the Louisville job. He left to take the Boston Celtics job. If he had gone from Kentucky to Louisville, that would have been such an insult. But that's not what he did. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was to think about Rick Pitino standing on the other side after he won so many titles and after you hated him so much down, down the road. 
that he was actually going to be coaching your team. I mean, it was weird. He was the figure in Kentucky basketball, the guy who took them from the depths of probation, of the Sports Illustrated cover with Kentucky Shame, and really brought them back to national prominence. And then he leaves, and you know, UK fans are thinking, you know, it, it sucks, but it's okay. And then when he comes back, he comes to your biggest rival. It's a storyline that's still surreal 11 years after it sort of began. At the end of Tubby Smith's time and uh, Billy Gillespie's time, Kentucky was not getting the very best players, and Kentucky wants the very best players. And Calipari did that. He restored that, uh, that superiority in the manpower. Cal is a P.T. Barnum, a Pied Piper, and a hell of a basketball coach, all rolled into one. The one thing with Calipari, he's always on message, and the message is always to recruits. That is the way he thinks and operates all the time. Alex Portros, can't believe it. Nine out of 10, 22 points, five rebounds, four for five from the line, and I'm all over him. Yeah, because I want him to be the best version of him, not just play good. Everything he says is calculated for effect, and everything he says is calculated to get the next bunch of recruits listening and saying, I want to play for that guy. He doesn't listen to rap. He doesn't know who Drake or Jay-Z is. But he gets them there because he knows that the players do. I think Kentucky fans always thought that celebrities were in the stands. But now there actually are. Well, uh, Ashley Judd. <laughs> but, but she's from Lexington. Yeah. And I don't think she technically is a star anymore. The results speak for themselves. He's done what he's telling these kids he's going to do. More Kentucky players have been drafted in the first round of the NBA draft over the past three years than any other program's ever done. He's a master, master motivator. He runs his practices like Coach Rupp used to. There's no assistant coaches on the floor. He stands in the middle of the floor, and he, he is the coach. I thought you hire a guy from Memphis. They just ripped a Final Four from them. I thought it was risky. World Wide West is one of his buddies. I don't know. He's either brilliant or he's a crook. Well, there's this assumption that Cal cheats, and fans, especially Louisville fans, are hoping that's true. I mean, they want it. They, 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 they sit in there like waiting for the thing to drop. I mean, look. If you've got national celebrities, movie stars, when Kentucky played Duke last week, Lil Wayne is sitting courtside cheering on Kentucky. Why does he need to give a few thousand dollars to get some kid to, to come to school? He just he doesn't need to. Coach Collard Party is, is, is just another uh, amazing fit for University of Kentucky, which throughout the history we haven't had that many coaches. He just has it all. Because coaching Kentucky basketball, it's not only grabbing your clipboard and being in a practice building with the guys. It's the community part, which is sometimes even much larger than the performance on the basketball. When Rick left Lexington, it was a divorce. Okay. And Lexington didn't replace the husband. All right. They tried. They dated around. Tubby didn't work out. It wasn't Tubby's fault, it wasn't their fault. It just didn't work out. Billy G was a disaster, it didn't work out. They finally replaced Rick. That was the biggest thing, is that I think a lot of them have let the Rick thing go because they got remarried. Now they're sort of emotionally happy, so now they, they're okay with things. If Rick's down at Louisville, that's fine, that's okay. I'm happy for you. Louisville, I'm happy for you. We're remarried. Sometimes I think uh, great coaches and athletes and teams need a great opponent to bring out the best in them. When Rick Pitino came in, the, the, he brought out the best in Denny Crum in a couple of those games. And when John Calipari came in, that was a whole new challenge for Rick Pitino. Cal infuriated Rick and re-energized Rick, both. Nobody could have written a book with this kind of intrigue. It's impossible to believe that that Rick Pitino is the head coach of the University of Louisville, and now the head coach at UK is one of the guys that he grew up being one of the biggest rivals with. It's just, there's so many different storylines to play. It really is Shakespearean. Oh boy. You know, uh, this rivalry right now is not about Kentucky and Louisville. It's about two Italians. Cal Perry and Patino hate each other. They, they, they can't say otherwise. I mean, they, they can act like they don't, but they do. Yeah, I, I can understand why you don't want to carry on a public feud, because that's counterproductive to what they're doing. But any pretense of a friendly relationship is false. This thing, and, and again, I, I tease and say we don't send Christmas cards, but when my mother passed, he sent me a card and said that there's going to be a mass said for your mother. I don't care what you hear from anybody else. There is no love lost between those two individuals. 
Let's just say if one was drowning and the other was standing there and there was nobody around to witness it, you'd have one dead person. Well, I think if his name was McGillicuddy and I'm Patino, would never be brought up. But it's, it's the Italian way. They always want to kill each other, you know, in the eyes of the public. Right. You know, they think this is some, you know, they think this is a it's mafia a, it's movie. A, it's a con <laughs> conspiracy. It's a rivalry. Uh, you've got uh, two Italians. Uh, what do you expect? You take Calipari and, and Patino, you're not going to find a bigger rivalry there. You can spin that any way you want to. Uh, it, there's passion on both sides there. They're alpha males. They love the spotlight, both of them. If one guy's getting the spotlight and they're not, they're hyper competitive. They want it. You know, I mean, from that standpoint, they have really actually goosed the rivalry up uh, significantly. They both want to be number one, and, and that's good. That's good for basketball in the state. sense of pride that you know, the two teams from uh, our state were playing for a shot to play in a national championship game and uh, Carolina and Duke had never been in that position so uh, it was Kentucky and Louisville the first ones to, uh, to, to have that kind of rivalry matchup. Having covered sports in the area here for 25 years it was the single greatest sporting event I've ever seen here. Police in Georgetown were called to a dialysis center Monday after a UK and U of L fan each 70 years old gave each other a full court press during their treatment. The dialysis story is about as odd as I've uh, ever heard. That, that week needed sort of a, a defining story that indicated just how crazy this rivalry is. And two guys fighting while they're hooked up to dialysis machines is about as insane Louisville, Kentucky as you can get. I didn't talk to him about the ball game. I was talking to another guy about the ball. He lived him and told me, shut up. And then and give me the finger. I said, what? I'm not talking to you. You know, I'm sitting there hooked up to a machine, and I can't do anything. And I hit him. Didn't hit him at hard, but I hit him. It's a microcosm of the entire rivalry. These people are dealing with gigantic issues in their, in their lives. They're elderly. They should be mature enough not to be fighting over basketball games, and yet it's still taking place. <laughs> That's by 90. Louisville by 10, man. That's by 90. Louisville, Louisville. Beat Louisville. Beat loser, loser. Cards by two, last second three. We got to, it's got to be the drama to put the stake in their heart. If you were in New Orleans and you were on Bourbon Street, all you saw was red and blue. It was what this rivalry is really all about. I would say at least 40 to 45,000 of those fans in New Orleans for that Final Four first round there were from Kentucky and Louisville. It's going to be a good game. It's going to all depend on about defense. You know, both teams are very good in defense, and, you know, right now Kentucky has a lot more talent than, than Louisville, but made the defense team win. I actually think Louisville will be in foul trouble and it'll be a blowout today. I'm kind of scared to see what happens. <laughs> I'd rather lose than to see what happens. <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather lose than to see, have to deal with her being depressed the rest of the weekend. The Final Four was one of the greatest Final Fours that I was ever a part of. Kentucky was uh, a very, very solid favorite to be the national champion. Louisville was just uh, felt very fortunate to be there. I think there was heavy anxiety for Kentucky fans. What if we lose? We have the best team. There's no way we can lose this game. Louisville was playing more with house money. It's all red and blue inside the dome. It's Jang. He's got Davis behind him. Davis trying to defend. Jones comes over and blocks it. This Kentucky team set a record. The most blocks in a season. Lamb with the baseliner in Kentucky. Three for three to open the game. Bahannon pull up. Jump for her. Oh, and back. my goodness. Blackshear. Timeout, Kentucky. Louisville makes a run. 
and cuts it to three or four or something like that. I left. I couldn't take it because I was like, if we lose this game, I'm not going to be able to handle it. I went and watched it in a bar across the street because I just couldn't deal with it. Louisville put up a good fight, but it, uh, it just wasn't going to happen. It was just too good a basketball team that John Calipari had. Kentucky wins the state championship and will play Monday night for the national championship. And hey, we just go ahead and play ball. You know, our fans travel a long way. And hey, we want to go ahead and give them a show and give them what they wanted with the national championship. It, it was fun for a lot of reasons. It probably wasn't as much fun after the game for Louisville. But to be there with Kentucky, Louisville, you know, and then Kansas and Ohio State, that's about as blue blood as you can get. And for Kentucky fans, I, I don't know many that can say they ever had a better moment. We've waited a long time for this eighth national championship. And that's the national championship ring. The championship game uh, was a testimony to Coach Calipari. It was a game where his superstar, Anthony Davis, had one basket and was still the star of the game. I always sort of enjoy, just on a personal level, somebody that can really impact a game without scoring a lot because it doesn't happen a lot. And it sort of, uh, ta it sort of makes the point about basketball being a team game. Calipari thrives on one and done, so I love him. I wouldn't want a four or five year recruit. You give some time to be lazy. You know you got to work because somebody else is coming in to take your spot. Calipari has the belief that if you give me the best players in the country, I'll win, regardless of whether they're freshmen or seniors. It's not a one and done. He goes and gets the best talent. You know, someone's going to get him. So when they say it's about one and done, no, he's just going to get the best talented players. If they, they're good to leave, then they do it. If they don't, they stay another year or two. I wish they had that one and done when I came out of high school. I would have done it too. <laughs> I can't pull for anybody that's got six one and outs. I can't. I like guys who come and stay two, three, four years, learn the city, learn the campus, learn the people and then move on, and then when they get their degree, they'll be extremely proud of it. There's two parts of this. My option is to recruit players that aren't quite good enough or to convince young people to stay when they should leave. Two things is actually a downside. For me personally, you don't, they, they don't stay long enough to get really, you just get attached to them and start to enjoy them as players, and then they're gone. In four years, you learn to really care about people. You, know, you get to know their families, their sisters, their background, their habits. You get to know their good parts and bad parts about them, and, they, and you care for them. Louisville fans know the backstories of every one of their players. I mean, this story about Peyton Siva uh, sort of saving his dad's life when he was 13 years old only came out in his junior season. Had he left after his freshman year, Louisville fans would never know it. And that's what UK fans know about their players. They know the, the simple stuff, and then they go to the NBA, and that's it. Calipari said, Last year we lost because we didn't have a team chemistry. What is a team? A team is five players who play together as a unit. They had good athletes. They shouldn't have been selfish. They should have come together. I know it broke their heart when, when uh, uh, Robert Morris just stormed the court like they just won a national championship. Oh man, that feels so good. People outside of the UK fan base acted like UK fans were gonna go crazy. They went crazy the Friday night they lost to Vandy. I think everybody was confident enough that last year was kind of a bit of an aberration that they just wiped last year out of their mind. It just it didn't happen. If, and I've, pr I've posed this question to many UK fans, uh, if it means having an NIT appearance every four years, if you go regional final, final four, national championship, and then you have to make an NIT appearance, would you do that? I've had 100% say yes. What do you think Global's chances are this year of winning the championship? I think they're the favorite. I mean, I think they're going to probably win. They're playing the best of anybody. They got the most uh, mature team in the thing. So I think they're probably uh, the favorite. You know, the best team doesn't always win. I think the best team probably wins about half the time. Kentucky was the best team last year and won, so uh, the odds would suggest this year the best team doesn't win, so that's what I'm hoping for. But I do think they're the best team, at least now. I can't watch them play. 
at all. Because they're going to win, and I hate that they're going to win. They're just so Louisville, and their fans, they're all drunk from the start to the finish with their tattoos, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, and I'm just, I'm so over it. And, and you know, I hate Duke. I mean, I, I hate Duke. But if they play Louisville, I'm a Cameron crazy this weekend. I'll paint my face, I'll jump up and down, you know, I'll do whatever, because we've got to have Louisville lose. What y'all got plans to win the NIT next year? Y'all seeking y'all revenge on Robert Morris? Hold on, hold on. I'm going to be there in just a minute. <laughs> so who's going to be more of a, 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 a letdown? The fact that Kentucky lost against Robert Morris? You or the fact that the number one overall team? Or the fact that the number one overall team does not win out? Number three into the season. Number three in the okay. nation, what, 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 what was their number in recruit class? One. No, one. One, three. The no one the same season Come on, they man, that's a for success. I think our championship is the fact that Kentucky doesn't do well. It's they, not our championship at all. Yes, it is. It's not our championship. Yes, it is. I didn't even watch the Robert Morris game. I did. The Louisville team in 2013 was really one of the first teams that came along that made me wish I was still writing a sports column because they had such an interesting mix of personalities. The thing you've got to love about Coach Patino is how he really molds a group of guys and turns them into a wonderful team. They made a good run. They made some, what, Final Four last year? Then we beat them. <laughs> we lost to them last year. We took it inside. They talked about what they did. Here we are, right back again in home. the Final Four. Kentucky's got the best basketball, period. And uh, I guess second best is Louisville, so we'll just keep the championship at the state. I guess sometimes second best has got to win. It's happening here tonight and Monday. I'm Donna. Put that wherever you want to put it. I predict it. We're bringing it home, Louisville. We're bringing it home for y'all, the KMR. Of course, I think uh, when Kevin Ware suffered that horrific injury against Duke in Indianapolis, I think Louisville became America's team. It, it galvanized people, I think, for a couple of reasons. One was it was a horrific injury, but then to see the way Luke responded to that and the team responded to it as well, I mean, it just put this tremendously human face on the Cardinals. You turn on Good Morning America and they're talking about Kevin Ware. You turn on the Evening News, they're talking about Kevin Ware. Everybody was talking about it. And the number one thought <laughs> going through Kevin Ware's mind at the moment of the broken leg. At least my break is not busted. <laughs> Louisville uh, had a tremendous year and, and the the Michigan game just showed uh, what the cards were made of. You couldn't ask for any better uh, of, of a championship game, the way those two teams went back and forth. Let's go Cards, baby. We're going to win it. Playing with inspiration, motivation, number one in the nation. I'm thinking we'll be national champs in a couple hours, but I'm really nervous right now. <laughs> Set out on top, but the ball is loose. And now they get it to see that it's going to be Louisville in front. And the Louisville Cardinals are the 75th NCAA College Basketball Champions. his second national title, first in Kentucky, and now at Louisville, the first man ever to do it at two different schools. Louisville just had so many people who stepped up, but that's that's how good they were, and Rick Pitino deserves all the credit. I mean, Pitino was incredible. He came back, what, three different games, ten points down? He sort of established the, the character of that team. I think nationally, the publicity it brought to L. how they really cared for this young man and how they rallied behind him. 
It's a great story. It was sort of like a, a worst case scenario for Kentucky because they not only were very good and won the national championship, they also had the best human interest story with Kevin Ware. So they had it all. Everything seemed like it fell in place then. Just like, you know, the Ware kid breaking his leg, you know, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, that shot should devastate him. Well, what happened next game? Walk on comes out and hits two threes when they're down to Wichita State and yeah. brings up, you know, helps them, helps them come back. So <laughs> everything was just aligned for them, just right, like it did for us the year before that. My first response to myself was, man, Louisville think they are getting closer to us. What? We got to do something. We got to step it up. We can't have two or three more seasons like the one we just had. Louisville going to think they own the state. That's what I thought first. What are we going to do to show them that they're not? Yeah. Hey, how you doing, big guy? <laughs> See all this blue up, in there? Hey, up, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah. yeah. I think I owe you a bit of apology for that, that, that win y'all got. I said we was going to smash y'all, y'all wasn't going to be nothing. Y'all probably be in NIT. Y'all made us eat our words, but... Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the opposite. Like, but, yeah, but you know I'm going to use? I'm going to use a line from Louisville fans, so, so don't hate on me. Wait till next year! Wait till next season. You got one coming. Y'all been on the losing end for so long. Now you're on the winning end. We get to say it. Wait till next year with our one and duds. You got five more to go. Five more to do what? Before you catch up with Kentucky. Why do you think somebody's trying to catch Come on, up? Come on, huh? Because you're always the little brother on the block. Next year, Kentucky will be back on top where we was. And you'll back, be back in your place where you ought to be. And everything will be back to normal. It'll be fine. Dude, the whole aura throughout the whole state of Kentucky will be, ah, it's back to we own this state. Y'all don't own nothing. Yes, we, we not, do. We're yes, not we even do. in the same state. Louisville's his own oh, state. Yeah. You know, Louisville, capital Louisville. But, but you, know, <laughs> you know, the the Louisville Kentucky rivalry. There's really two factions. I think it's the Louisville fans in Louisville against the Kentucky fans in Louisville. There is a strong Kentucky fan base over in the city of Louisville. There's no question about that. The University of Kentucky's largest alumni group is located here in Jefferson County. There's probably more. Kentucky fans in Louisville than Louisville fans in Louisville. I hear from the L haters all the time that uh, live around here. I get, I get mail, you see it on social media, saying, you know, I used to think that mayor was a good guy, but he's over the top for L. I'm never going to vote for him again. You know, this kind of stuff. And the people that come up and talk to me and they try to counsel me about this, I just look them in the eye and say, remember, I'm the mayor of Louisville, not Lexington. The city of Louisville is divided. And the city of Louisville is divided hard, and that's kind of ground zero. Once you leave Louisville, everywhere else is Kentucky. Everywhere else is, is Kentucky. Kentucky. It? Yeah, they ain't got no sense. That's what it tells you. <laughs> they out there working, making moonshine, <laughs> and rooting for Kentucky, and betting on horses. That's what we do in Kentucky. That's the way it is. And any of them with sense live in Louisville and go for Louisville. There's so many Kentucky fans in the city of Louisville and there are so many Louisville fans who want to say, this is our place, this is where we play, go watch your team somewhere else, uh, that it's so funny to see that mix. Yeah, they all just kind of meet up here for drinks in this little, this little town and everything goes nuts. The sports top prize on the line with Louisville and Kentucky playing each other, the state would explode. The city would be on fire. The city would be on fire. People would not be able to handle it. There'd be a whole bunch of people down there on 6th Cedar in jail. There, there would be riots. There'd be a whole bunch of people in the middle of the street. You know, it, the celebration may go on for hours. They could get there on opposite sides of the bracket. And uh, I hope I'm there to see it. I've been fortunate to see a lot of a lot of great games uh, between the two schools with so much on the line. Going to the Final Four, playing in the Final Four, uh, but, but to play for the championship, uh, yeah, that, would, that would top it all. As a state, we are pretty much the kings of basketball right now. If you want to talk college basketball, it's not in Chapel Hill, it's not Tobacco Road, it's the state of Kentucky right now. Give me another state that wins a national championship one year with one team, the national championship the next year with another team, and then as you go into 2014, it could be again, one of those two again. Kentucky has a, this 
class of freshmen that, you know, is it the best class ever? And Louisville has, uh, they're the defending national champion with most of those players back. And I think that's what gets everybody so excited in Kentucky about college basketball is kind of having these discussions on which way it's going to go. And I hope that continues for an awfully long time. It's good for our cities and it's good for the state. I don't see Cal going anywhere soon. I don't see Rick going anywhere soon. I think you're going to see this rivalry even get better. You can talk about blue and red all you want. It's Kentucky. It's the state of Kentucky and it's the state of Kentucky that benefits. Because after all, at the end of the day, we're all Kentuckians. This win also made Coach Patino the first coach in history to win the championship uh, at two different schools. And we won't name the other one right now. The easiest thing in the world is to denigrate someone today. You know, I, I listen to, it's only 5% of the local fans and 5% of the Kentucky fans that do it. You know, the rest of it, you know, like I said, yes, they're all married to each other, they live comfortably, you know, <laughs> you know so they have children together, you know, so it's, um, you know, now, 